All right. Hey, it's look. Ready to chaplain uncover. Cover. This time we're going to take seats. This time we're going to have a little, uh, little change in the schedule. We've got uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, David uh, Refine from the United American Panthers who wants to teach us a little bit. He's back behind me here and we'll have him come to the podium. Sir, do you like it?
Uh, but what's really great about this photo, and I'm glad I was able to find this, this is my father. He was a commandant of the Marine Corps League up in Fort Washington, New York. And uh, you know, I'll tell you, I used to love going to the Marine Corps meetings, uh, Marine Corps League meetings, and I, I became uh, a life member of Marine Corps League. And uh, it was just, it was one of those things where when all of a sudden we found out we had an opportunity to speak here, uh, it was very emotional for me. I lost my father about eight years ago, and uh, I know he would have loved to have been here with us. So that being said, I, I just want to tie it all around. And so I guess we have one more slide up here. I, I did end up becoming a successful battlefield commander. This is me with my, my last uh, special operation task force with a bunch of reconnaissance Marines leading them into Iraq on the first day of uh, the war there, served in Afghanistan, uh, Panama before that first Gulf War. So I had a bit of experience, and, and why this is important, because this ties this in to this organization, United Amer American Patriots, and Bob Wyman. So Bob Wyman, who I trust and respect and all the rest, he goes, hey, Bull, I want you to be a part of this organization. I said, great, what's it all about? These war criminals who are sitting in prison, we're going to get them out. I'm like, are you out of your freaking mind? For three years, he tried to explain to me why this was important. For three years, I thought he had gone crazy. And the point was, look, I've served multiple tours in combat. Not one of my Marines had ever committed a war crime. And they always served honorably. Why would I possibly want to try and support these war criminals? And it wasn't, and it took a long time until I was actually on Capitol Hill. Bob actually asked me to stand up there for an event and listen to what was going on. It was the first time I really listened. And all of a sudden, I realized that every one of these warriors who, like all of us here, at one point stood up and swore to support the Constitution of the United States, which a lot of people outside of here, they don't understand how important that is. But this is our individual rights. Like, this is, this is something that it's unparalleled in like the history of the world that a, a nation of warriors defends a piece of paper for individual rights. Because warriors throughout times have served kings and have been you know, conscripted for all these other reasons, but to serve individual rights, that's huge. And our warriors who are doing this were not having their rights protected. And all of a sudden, when you start peeling back what was going on, it became more and more disturbing. So I'm hoping that my presentation will be disturbing to you today, disturbing enough so that you'll go out and spread the word and help us with our mission. That's my intent. So let's go to the next slide here, and so you understand who the founder of this organization was. So Major uh, Donahue, is there any way, where's our IT person? Where's that lady? Who killed? The, well, not the IT lady. I think it's on this clicker. <laughs> Sir, it's on your clicker that's up front there, I think. it's. I'm certain I'm going to screw this yeah, up. You did it. Don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. All right. So, Major Bill Donahue, United States Marine Corps, combat veteran, multiple combat tours, multiple Purple Hearts, multiple decorations for valor. He's sitting home one day, and all of a sudden, he sees, next slide, this Hedita incident. So these are Marines who were serving in combat that were ambushed and got into a, a major firefight. But all of a sudden, there was some information that came out and said, well, we're not quite sure that that's what happened. And Congressman Murtha, in this cartoon is kind of showing, he started calling them cold-blooded murderers. And basically saying that these Marines were not in a firefight. They had not been ambushed. And all of a sudden, that these Marines just decided to go walking into the building and start killing a whole bunch of civilians. Now, Bill Donahue, who had been in combat, he understood that sometimes things get blurry. He also understands that sometimes civilians and innocent people get killed. But he also understood that it's, you know, we talk about you know, the rule of law. And we must 
must uphold the rule of law. And what people don't understand is that in combat, it's not the rule of law, it's the law of war. Because the rule of law says you can't kill someone. That's illegal. Well, in combat, we know we kill people. So we have the law of war. And when innocent individuals get killed, which is regrettable, nobody wants that to happen, but that's sometimes called collateral damage. Because when we're trying to destroy the enemy, occasionally, civilians get harmed. Now, we go out of our way. We're one of the most humane militaries that has ever walked the planet. But the situation does happen. And our warriors, when it does happen, they must be given the presumption of innocence and view that from the lens of the law of war, not the rule of law. But this all got distorted because a lot of these recent conflicts all of a sudden became very political, as much of everything has become very political right now. So that being said, you got a congressman who was coming out and he was saying a lot of these things, which he was actually brought up on slander charges by two of these Marines. Uh, and seven of the Marines were brought up on charges. All the charges were ultimately dismissed. And the whole thing went away because the, the evidence didn't support this. But this was what's called, in some parlance, undue command influence or unlawful command influence. So here's a senior member of the federal government, a congressman, who's coming out and, and basically saying, punish these guys before they had even been charged. And that's where the system is broken, because in America, we must have the presumption of innocence. And then the evidence must take us to the conclusion that the individuals are guilty. Major Donnie, who felt so strongly about this, he mortgaged his own home to fight for these individuals' rights. And that was the founding of this organization in 2005. And I just recently took over, just a couple of years ago, only because Bill's health started to fail. But he's still very much adamantly supporting the rights of individuals. So next slide. So how UAP works? What, what exactly is this all? Well, first part, next slide, is you've got warriors who are wrongfully accused or unjustly incarcerated. That's the first thing that ends up happening. Then the challenge is that they're facing, next slide, is you've got what's called unlawful command influence, prosecutor misconduct, and investigator abuse. These are all big technical terms. I'll break them down in a minute, okay? But Understand those are kind of the challenges. So, next slide. What has to happen is we come in to protect our warriors' rights. Now, people say, well, wait a second, if you're in the military, don't you get appointed a military attorney? Yes, you get appointed a military attorney. And the convening authority who's overseeing this court martial is overseeing both the prosecution and the defense. Do you think there might be something wrong with that system? When all of a sudden both these individuals, they're gonna be determined on whether or not they get promoted within this system based upon the outcome of what that commanding general wants to see? There's definitely an imbalance there to where the defense does not have a clear, clean, and true defense. It's always biased. The scale is biased in the government's favor. And understand, the Uniform Code of Military Justice is not necessarily a system to determine truth and justice. It was designed for good order and discipline, to maintain discipline on the battlefield. The commander needed a tool but to make it look a little bit fair. And so this is it's very different from our own system, I should say, our, our, the civilian system. For example, when a jury of 12 people has to decide on whether or not to convict an individual, let's say, of murder, there must be a unanimous jury. It means all 12 people. If one person, maybe you've seen the movie, that one, uh, 12 Angry Men or something like that, if one person says, I don't see it, case dismissed, the accused murderer walks. And now, do, do a lot of criminals walk? Yes, because that's our system. We would rather see a thousand criminals walk than one 
innocent person put in prison. That's the sort of the concept behind our whole system. The military, just the opposite. You only need two thirds of the jury to convict, and you don't need 12 people. They can do it with five. So instead of trying to con a, a, a prosecutor trying to convince 12 people, all he's got to do is get three. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a lot easier. And all of a sudden, what's not surprising is you've got a 98% conviction rate. Wow. Either those military prosecutors are that good or the system is that lopsided. Quite frankly, the more we look into it, we find the system really is lopsided against our warriors. And I'll tell you right now, I served 25 years as a Marine, and I never knew that. And, I wouldn't, and if somebody told me it, I wouldn't believe it until I started looking into the details. So next slide. We come in and we start providing funding to facilitate, next slide, legal defense. We get civilian attorneys who have prior military experience, most of them are Marines, they're really good, and they understand the civilian, they've got civilian practices, and they've handled military cases, so they know what they're doing. They come in, and guess what? They don't have to worry about getting promoted. They don't care about what the convening authority has to say about them. They don't care about the system. They focus on the individual and the individual's rights. So now all of a sudden, they, they've got a clean path we're moved. Next slide. We provide family support because all of a sudden, a lot of these guys, young lads, corporal, corporal, sergeant, whatever, they don't have funding for this. A legal defense, if you're being accused of murder, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. We've had cases going to millions of dollars. We owe attorneys right now $600,000 over multiple cases that we're supporting. Families, they don't get to see their loved ones unless we provide support for them. And we do, we provide transportation so that the family unit can stay together and they can maintain contact. But next slide. Next piece is that we help the reintegration process because when all of a sudden these guys their cases are overturned, they receive pardons, parole, clemency, whatever, and they step out into the civilian world. Well, we don't want these guys sitting on the freaking corner begging in some Marine Corps uniform saying, ah, oh, I was a Marine, what? No, hell no. These are warriors, and we're gonna get them out and treat them with respect and set them up for success. Not one warrior that we've gotten out of prison has ever gone back. Is that zero recidivism? Not one. And that's important because we set them up for success. Next slide. We also inform, and this is a big part of our mission here. First part, next slide, is the public. Now we do this for a couple of reasons. One, the public ends up providing a lot of morale to the individuals that they're incarcerated. They send birthday cards and all the rest. We, we keep people informed. The next part is to provide the support throughout our legal system. Next slide. We have Congress. We encourage people to talk to their congressmen and make them aware of what's going on. And the congressmen, they're working right now. We help to establish what's called the Justice for Warriors Caucus that are working on a strategic level to redesign the Uniform Code of Military Justice so it's more fair for our warriors. They also make sure that they're elevating information to the President of the United States. Next slide. We get information to the President of the United States and we been able to get pardons for these warriors when all of a sudden all of the appeals process has been shut down. Then all of a sudden the president can come in and say, hold on a second. So the recent pardons you've seen for warriors, those are mainly things that were driven by UAP. And what's interesting is the media portrays these in two different ways. If the media hates the president, then they're going to hate who's being receiving the pardon and they're going to paint them as horrible murderers. If the media believes that, or you know, likes the president or vice versa, they're going to portray it in a different way. And we saw this as we were working through when President Obama was the president and when President Trump was the president. And people come to it. I got attacked by the media saying, you know, why are you dealing with President Trump? Because he's the president of the United States. He's the only person who can provide pardons. And guess what? I will be dealing with President Biden as well because he's the president of the United States. So I don't care. This organization is apolitical. It's all about individuals' rights. So this is kind of a big overview, big crazy slide. We'll go into a little bit more detail and have a little bit more fun with the next slides. Next slide. 
So our nation's warriors are wrongfully accused and convicted by commanders who they're concerned about their careers. They want to be promoted. They want to seem like they're hard commanders. Prosecutors want to see their careers go forward and investigators. But what exactly are they doing? Let's just do a quick list. Next. They withhold what's called exculpatory information. This means that if there's evidence that shows he didn't do the crime, they hide it. Not only is that illegal, that's unconstitutional. That's freaking ridiculous. That's like if there's a witness that says, oh no, that person was at my house, they weren't there. Shh, they get rid of them. And we'll go into detail about this, because I know it's sort of like, come on, seriously? Seriously? Next slide. <coughs> they make false and inappropriate statements. We've had general officers come out and say, that individual is absolutely guilty. He's just like, you know, the situation in, in Me Live where you had Cali going in and gunning down civilians. While the case is ongoing, like this is not appropriate for general officers to sway military personnel who are saying, wow, well, the general thinks he's freaking just like Cali. We better freaking convict him. Whether or not the evidence supports it, because at the end of the day, those people that are on the jury, they all work for that general. And so everybody here is in the same command. And so it's not like a jury out in the civilian world where it's like, all right, I'm going to go back to being a pizza maker, and I'm going to go back to being a mechanic, I'm going to do it. They're all going back to the same command and be like, hey, you know what? He voted not guilty. We still convicted him, but I question his judgment. You're right. He's not getting promoted. Now, that's not going to be an open conversation. That's all going to be closed doors. And all of a sudden, you're not going to understand why you didn't get promoted or why you didn't get that job. It's because you didn't play team ball. So next slide. They intimidate and manipulate witnesses all the time. And they tell people, you're not getting promoted if you do this. Or if you testify on behalf of this criminal, you're going to ruin your career. The guy's like, ah, gee, I love being a Marine. I don't want to ruin that. Okay, next slide. They coerce false confessions. Literally, they have had individuals get on the stand and say, yes, I saw him murder someone. Like, it, when it did not happen, why would they do that? Because they say, look, you're an accomplice to this crime. Like, there was no crime. Yes, but we're going to make it a crime. And you're going to be an accomplice, and we're going to put you in prison. Unless you say he did it. Fine, he did it. And it's really sad when you think about military people having their honor and their, their integrity being bent like this. But it's happening. Next slide. They silence and dismiss, dismiss forensic experts. One of the individuals, First Lieutenant Michael Behenna, one of the first parties President Trump gave, everybody came out and said, this guy's a murderer. He shot someone in cold blood. He was interrogating someone. He shot him and he killed him. True. It happened. Behenna claims it was in self-defense. The prosecutors, interestingly, they actually had the body this time. They, they worked from, from that. They no longer maintained the bodies because that's real evidence. What they did is they hired a forensic expert, one of the best in the nation, who actually came up with the whole blood splatter concept, all the rest, to do forensic autopsy on the body. And the prosecutor's expert says to the prosecutors, here's my report. He's right, he acted in self-defense. Everything shows that this guy was going for him and he acted in self-defense. Prosecutors fired the expert, buried the report, convicted the guy of murder. Fact. The president got all the facts, saw all the evidence, spoke to the expert, gave him a pardon. The media came out and said, oh my God, how can you pardon murderers? So these are the crazy things that are going on right now. And it's tough to get the truth out there because all of a sudden, once the story is going in one direction, trying to turn it back is really tough. Next slide. They violate the attorney-client privilege. In recent news, there was a case, Navy SEAL, Eddie Gallagher. The prosecutors tapped into the emails that were being exchanged between the, the attorney and the client. They were using spyware. It was identified. The government didn't deny it. That is a federal offense. That prosecutor should be charged with a crime and if found guilty, put in prison. What'd they do? Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Get off that case. What, what, is his, what are his charges being preferred? Never. There has never been one prosecutor in the United States Armed Forces ever been held criminally liable for criminal action. Never once. So think about it. This is like saying, look, why don't we rob a bank? Whoa, dude, what if we get caught? Nothing. What? Wait, what if we get away with it? You get lots of money. Wait, wait, so 
So we rob a bank and we get away with it, nothing happens, right? And we get caught, nothing happens, right? Why wouldn't you? If you're a prosecutor, you know your career is going to go great, and you don't care about the lives of the warriors, you're more concerned about your own. Take the risk, because there is no risk. That's exactly the issue here. Next slide. Identify enemy combatants as civilians. They do this all the time. If they, if they want to try and get a prosecution, and the enemy tells the US government, your Americans, they're killing civilians. Oh my god, we're going to go our way to prosecute. Now, it doesn't matter that the enemy is telling us that these were civilians. This is where our organization comes in, which the government never anticipated. We send investigators over there, and guess what we find out? The DNA, fingerprints, and all of the biometric data of those individuals that they call civilians that they maintain in a database identifies them all as enemy combatants. So our warriors are killing enemy combatants, but they're being held accountable for killing civilians because the enemy has said that. And the media picks up on it. Next slide. Oh, this is a great one. We transported enemy combatants into the country to testify against United States warriors. And you can't be like, oh, well, maybe they didn't know. Not only did they know, they changed the name, they put them down as government contractors, they gave them false passports, flew them into the country, then put them on airlines, Delta Airlines. We know, we know we have the boarding passes. We did the Freedom of Information Act. We have all this information. So you might have been sitting next to a terrorist who was going to testify against a warrior who did testify, and they ended up convicting that warrior, and they were so happy. What they do? Well, you take him to Disneyland. No, you don't. No, you take him to SeaWorld. That's exactly what they did. We have the freaking receipts. They took these terrorists to SeaWorld. Next slide. This is actually this is a, a, a cartoon. It's actually coming out, I think, next week that addresses this. This guy's name is Haji Wazir. He was, he's the lead prosecutor's, prosecutor's uh, witness. He testified against Staff Sergeant Bob Bales. Nobody ever saw the bodies. They just claimed he killed civilians. And now he's in prison for life. And how he was here is back home with all this money that we paid him, salation payments, and a great experience with his pictures at SeaWorld. The tr truth is more bizarre than reality. Or, I'm sorry, than fantasy. This is another case we deal with, Staff Sergeant Gibbs, where the prosecution does this all the time. They're like, hey, you're a pot smoker, you're a druggie, we know that you did this and that, you're a murderer and all the rest, but you're just a junior guy. If we can get a more senior guy, we'll do that. So we'll trade in your confession, reduce your charges, as long as we get someone else convicted. Okay. And that's what they do. They coerce testimony. We got Staff Sergeant Gibbs sitting in prison right now. Well, these three, well, two of the druggies are out. One will be out, I think, in about five years. Gibbs is there for the rest of his life for murder. Three counts of murder. Two of them, he was not even present when the murders took place. The third one, the witness said it was a justifiable engagement with the enemy. And he even said, Gibbs didn't fire first. I did. We came around the corner. Gibbs was in shock. I opened fire. Then Gibbs fired. Three counts of murder. He's sitting in prison the rest of his life. We're fighting to get him out. Next slide. Why? Because it's all good for the prosecutors. They get promoted. They're going to get big paying jobs when they get out. So the prosecutor's motivation is not aligned with truth, justice, and the American way. The commanders, the commanding general, they're concerned about their promotion. They become very political. And I want to be clear, not all generals. Okay? It's not all of our leaders. It's not all of the armed forces. And this is where you know, a couple of times people are like, well, you don't sound very American. You know, you don't sound like you like our military. Just the opposite. I love our country. I love our military. I love my wife. And you want to know something? Here's the best analogy. When my wife had cancer, I didn't stop loving her. I loved her more. But I was going to fight like hell to make sure that cancer did not take her life. That's what's going on now. In the military, we have a cancer. 
It's this uniform code of military justice and the way that individuals, commanders, prosecutors, investigators are getting away with crimes and they're harming our warriors. And I'm gonna fight like hell to make sure that cancer does not kill our armed forces. Really important. Next slide. So, here's a quick case study, if you will. Murdering civilians, or was it murdering civilians? You know, just some Afghans out here having a great time. Next slide. Okay, this is the case of Clint Lawrence. Next slide. So if the prosecution was here telling you the story, they would say, look, three Afghan civilians out having a little joyride on a motorcycle, beautiful day, out in the country, and then what happens? Next slide. Clint Lawrence orders his soldiers, kill them. Next slide. Two are killed, one escapes. Some random civilians, we don't even know what their names were. We just know they were civilians. Next slide. That these civilians, because of Clinton Lawrence's order, Clinton Lawrence is now convicted of two counts of murder, one count of attempted murder. Next slide. 20 years in prison. Cut and dry, right? If you were the jury, you're like, well, okay, what's the deal? This lieutenant told them to kill innocent civilians. Lock them up, throw away the key. But what if that wasn't really the case? And after he was convicted, after he was in prison, we got involved because we found out about it. And what if that, instead of civilians, he was actually engaging Taliban enemy combatants? Might that change your opinion if you're on the jury? Next slide. So, first slide. Let's understand where they were, first of all, because a lot of times the way the media places this, it's like, oh, we're just out in Main Street, USA. Everybody's having a good time. And oh, hey, shoot, let's start killing civilians. But where exactly was Clinton Lawrence when all this was happening? Next slide. Saudi Afghanistan was known as the heart of darkness. This was where the Taliban actually started and they found it and they started developing. Most of their bomb makers, next slide, came out of Saudi Afghanistan. So this was a really, really bad place. How bad? Let's look. Next slide. From March to August of 2012, the time up to and around when Clinton Lawrence incident happened, 16 KIAs, right there. They were all killed by improvised explosive devices, and there were dozens of others that were wounded. Well, well how was this, how was it like leading up? I mean, like right up to this case. I don't know, let's look. Oh, wow, the 30 days prior to the incident, there were improvised explosive devices going off just about every day, sometimes two and three. Okay, like, civilians can't get their heads around this. Think about not just the actual incident where people get blown up, but when you're driving in your vehicle, you're constantly in this fear of getting killed. All right, well, how bad was it in Clint Lawrence's unit? Well, let's find out. Clint Lawrence actually replaced First Lieutenant Dominic Lentino. He was the other platoon leader. Well, why did he leave? Oh, well, let's see. Oh, he got blown up. He was medically evacuated for taking shrapnel to his abdomen, face, and eyes. So Clint Lawrence, was he just a boot lieutenant and know what the heck he was doing? No, actually he was prior enlisted staff sergeant. Prior enlisted staff sergeant who said, I'm taking care of my soldiers. And he was put in charge of this platoon. Why? Because he was the most talented, insightful, and capable warrior leader that they had. They put him in charge down there. He was so good, the company commander, the battalion commander, nobody even went over and do the handoff. He said, you got it, lieutenant. Take care of him. Tighten him up. They've got some discipline problems. He goes down there, within three days, he's tightening them up. What happens when a new lieutenant comes into your unit and starts tightening it up? You hate that guy. So these guys hated the new lieutenant. Because all of a sudden, they had to wear their equipment properly, they had to make sure their weapons were clean, they had to make sure that their combat positions were all set properly, and they got lax and lazy. That's why they kept getting blown up. So, so their, their unit hated them. And that's why, you know, the government, you know, civilians are like, well, his own men testified against him. This is not a football team where everybody's hanging out drinking. He is the lone supervisory leader in charge of a unit that doesn't like that he's tightened him up. Within three days of him being there, what happens? Next slide. Slide. Well, all right, this is, this is actually a little bit more important. Who are the civilians? So we know who the civilians are because we have the names of all of them. But the prosecutor crossed out all the names, and they just said, a male of apparent Afghan descent. 
And that stood. Why would they do that? Because they knew that clinical rants killed enemy combatants. They were in the database. Shh. We're going to lose. Change the names. And the judge allowed it. And so they went to trial with just some random civilians. So how can a prosecutor, how can the defense defend against random civilians? Who are they? Who knows? Had no bodies. Now, what's worse is that the prior lieutenant even said, I would never allow a motorcycle to come around our unit because that's a part of the enemy's tactic, technique, and procedures. So the prior lieutenant gave this warning and even came and testified. The prosecution didn't line that one out because they don't want to see all this stuff. So, next slide. We're going to stop. We're running a little long, so let me go through. They were never found, he was never found guilty of violating rules of engagement. Next slide. Okay, next slide. This is what actually happened. Three guys came in. Next slide. PFC was a former cop engaged consistently with rules of engagement. Next slide. Put the ranks, realized that this was a threat. He told, next slide, his heavy guns to engage. They engaged. Next slide. Two guys killed. We know exactly who they were. Next slide, one guy escaped. Next slide. Other engagements were happening at the time. It was a full-on engagement. This was not just some random thing happening. Next slide. The, end, the US government hid the significant activity report about the day where it said that the platoon was being scouted for an impending ambush and attack, and that one enemy combatant was killed that day. They hid that report. The jury never knew about it. Again, don't want to mess up the civilian story. Next slide. Aerostat operators saw the whole thing, knew exactly what was happening. He was never called to testify. Next slide. We came in, we found, we were able to get an investigator to find the DNA that found that these guys were actually Taliban, not civilian. All this was brought to the government. Government ignored it. They refused to even take it up on appeal. They never even took this case to appeal. Next slide. Politics involved? Yes. We we'll just click through some of the incidents leading up to this. <coughs> just keep clicking through this, Mark. Marines urinating on dead and certain uh, warriors that they killed. Next slide, Qurans burning. Next slide, you had uh, an incident with Bob Bales. Next slide, <coughs> front page newspaper. Next slide, you had drafts of strategic partnership agreements. You had status force agreements. You had China getting involved, bringing in Afghanistan into economic discussions. Next slide, Clint Lawrence's case. They were going to find this kid guilty, whether or not the facts supported it. Next slide. All these agreements were not signed until after Bales and Lawrence were found guilty. Next slide. We had to bring up the president, president, his staff, POJ, everything reviewed, everything in detail. They pardoned Clint Lawrence. He spent six years in prison. An innocent man spent six years in prison. Next slide. Next slide. Right now, we've got a case, three Marine Raiders, two gunnery sergeants, Josh Lebron, Danny Dreher, and one corpsman, Special Operations corpsman, were supporting. Same thing's happening. These guys did not commit a crime. There was a rush to judgment, and now the government's embarrassed, and so they're going to bring them to trial. And they've even tried saying, OK, we're not going to hold it for manslaughter. How about if we just give you a lesser trial? These are our best of our best. They said, screw you. You will not crush my integrity. And they're staying against it. The government doesn't know how to handle it. So these are the cases that we handle. I think we've got last slide. These are multiple warriors we've got pardons for, clemency, paroles, and we're going to continue to fight the right fight. I appreciate you giving me your time. And if there's any other questions, I'm going to be around here. I look forward to drinking and eating with everybody tonight. Thank you, and God bless you. Keep up the great work.